Well, I'm delighted to get to introduce uh, our speaker, Peter Hedrius. You know, I've set out, I, I consider myself something of a internet sleuth and can find information about most of you. <laughs> <laughs> and so I set out to try and find some interesting things to say about, about Peter, but actually, Peter, you're managing your online presence extremely well. I could not find anything that wasn't in your bio. So, then I was tempted to resort to the telephone, <laughs> but I didn't. So, uh, <laughs> Peter uh, is chair and professor of philosophy at San Jose State University. And, but before he did that, he got an undergraduate degree in music. And he worked as a professional uh, jazz pianist in New York City. Um, I think while he was taking grad classes at the same time, or? Uh, well, at any rate, um, so he has a very interesting background. And in his, in his main gig with uh, philosophy, he's published in a number of areas, uh, including Aristotle, phenomenology, philosoph philosophy of economics, philosophy of music and deconstructionism. And on this day, uh, it might be worth mentioning that one of his relatively recent books is titled A Phenomenology of Love and Hate. So please welcome Peter Hades. It sounds like the internet is being kind of kind to me. I'm sure you did. <laughs> really, though. Um, okay, I have um, 16 carefully written pages, but I'm sure I would bore you to death if I read them. So I'm going to try my best to uh, paraphrase, paraphrase them as we go through, but I will have to, I think, sometimes read. Anyway, I wanted to thank first Chris, and I also very much wanted to thank Annie Borden. Where is Annie Borden here? Yeah, who did a wonderful job at setting things up. I'm sure that there's an awful lot of energy that goes into that, and I'm very grateful. Okay, well, I am probably, as far as online teaching goes, best known because of my department that sent an open letter to Michael Sandel. Um, and what I'm gonna do is talk about that. Uh, and then I will give you some reflections that I have about MOOCs. And that's gonna be pretty much it. Um, the open letter to Michael Sandel, I asked Chris last night to uh, send it to you uh, electronically and there probably are copies available. That is not to make it an assignment, that's for sure. But people did say, uh, you know, we'd like to read it. and. Um, so you can pretty easily. Okay, so let me tell you about this strange, perfect storm that took place. Um, never happened while I was a jazz pianist, I must say, but it happened uh, about MOOCs, which is, I guess, the way life works. Anyway, this letter, um, it was published in the Chronicle of Higher Education. Oh, let me say one other thing first about the letter, is that I've oftentimes been the, thought of as being the author of the letter, and I'm not, and uh, the talk about gender issues as it came up, fascinating talk this morning. The two authors, I think I'm not breaking confidence, are both women. Um, they are the primary authors. We, in our department, we all, we got together and we made various little changes. But in fact, it was they who I think wrote the substance of the letter and very much wanted to be directed as an open letter to Michael Sandel. So I want to credit them, in fact, uh, they, they really, they say, you must say that it's from the philosophy department as a whole. It's a very, very kind of in solidarity move that we make, but I figure, you know, give credit where it's due. As professors Rita Manning and Professor Karen Brown, they in fact were primary authors. Okay, now what happened with this letter? Uh, it was published in the Chronicle of Higher Education, April 29th, 2013, and then it got picked up within four days by the New York Times. Uh, Tamara Liu in the New York Times cited it and used it as a way of talking how MOOCs were developing. And then since then, it just bounced from one publication to the next. And this is something, as I say, new to me. But some of them were the Los Angeles Times, the Wall Street Journal, uh, Nation, it was several times the New York, in the New York Times again, right up through a few weeks ago. 
believe me, that is a short list. I just noticed on my iPhone this morning that there is a woman in Switzerland who wants to be interviewed, who wants to interview me. It's to go on Swiss TV about the letter, so it doesn't stop. Um, <coughs> the Chronicle of Higher Education then elected our department. They do this once a year to the top 10 educational influences for the year, and we were among those because of the letter. Um, and then I got all these remarkable things that you probably some of you have been, in, have been in this position before. I never have. Ralph Nader sent me a letter, and uh, I don't usually hear from Ralph. <laughs> and, and then he said, why don't you read the following books? In fact, he sent me a couple of books, which I've since read. Uh, I got on Michael Krasny's forum. It was on NPR. There's all sorts of places that it went on. It's kind of like a, a um, rogue wave, I've since found, uh, these sort of thing. It can pick you up and you just find yourself being carried someplace and you don't know where they're going to land because having seen what happens with some of the people who are interviewed in my department, you don't know what the reporters, unless you start getting cagey as we did, what the reporter's point of view is and you could end up saying something or in effect your communication is quite opposite to what you had intended. So it is I, com fairly compared to a rogue wave. It can land you rather on high ground or it can land or you can drown. Um, and that's what it feels like. Um, but I have to also say, um, it wasn't the notoriety, of course, that we're proud of. I, maybe this goes without saying. But in fact, I'm particularly proud of the junior faculty. One of the people that I mentioned is a junior faculty member. And this takes courage, because I'll tell you sort of the background in our, in our institution why it does. Um, their jobs, their reputations, uh, they had something to uh, lose in signing this letter. The, we didn't know that it was going to get the notoriety. It's a typical case of whistleblowing. In a sense, this is a kind of whistleblowing. Uh, if you get enough notoriety, you're fine. But most whistleblowers don't, and therefore their employers or their supervisors, whatever it is, begin to uh, treat them as some sort of traitor, and they oftentimes uh, you know, lose their jobs, etc. So this was courage, and um, I'm very proud of that. I said the senior faculty members, we don't have that much to lose. Uh, if I retire this year, fine. Next year, fine. You know. Okay, but junior faculty, different. Okay, so what were the circumstances? Let me give you a little bit of the background. Now we're talking about Michael Sendell's edX course in justice. All right, um, and in case I know some of you, see, I was I was speaking to you who spoke this morning. In fact, you took uh, Michael Sendell's course. Uh, well, maybe people don't know who he is, so just let me give you a, an idea of his his uh, celebrity. Um, this is fairly recent. Um, this is June 2012. 15,000 students appeared at the South, Seoul South Korea University in outdoor amphitheater to hear him conduct an audio-centric, audience-centric discussion of ethics. He was asked later um, to throw the first baseball at Seoul's uh, biggest baseball stadium. So he was treated as a kind of popular hero. And I mean, this is odd to me. But nonetheless, this is some idea of his notoriety. All right, now, <clears throat> he had affiliated himself with edX. Now, you've already heard quite a bit of edX, but a little bit more about it. Uh, edX, at least officially, uh, took on its name and its activities in May 2012 with grants of $300 million apiece from MIT and from Harvard. Um, they're known for MOOCs, but they're also known for something that I'm going to call SPOCs. Now, uh, when this term was used before, uh, the acronym was worked out differently. My understanding, it stands for small private open courses. I think you said small personalized. personalized. Well, I do. Well, that's the trouble with acronyms. But I think that it's used both. It's used both. Okay. Well, then you can have it either way. But in fact, it's SPOCs that are more of the problem as far as edX is concerned. Um, and it was certainly uh, the edX course from Michael Zendel was a Spock. And you no doubt would associate that with Star Trek, uh, Dr. <laughs> Spock, and I assume that's intended there. Anyway, it's a kind of, you could also say, flipped course. Uh, the acronym, let me just put it both ways. It's a small, personal private, as you would like, online 
cores, quite different from a MOOC, strictly speaking. Okay. Um, now, the basic idea with a SPOC is that, at least from edX, is that you have a professor from Stanford, Berkeley, uh, Harvard, usually a um, prestigious university, and that course is piped into a not-so-prestigious university and is taught through that professor. The um, professor of the not-so-prestigious university then can function in different ways. Uh, can be anything from a teaching assistant, in effect, to someone who does participate more. But at least to, as far as edX contracts go, and sometimes this is not made clear, uh, one needs to maintain the structure of the course. You can't, it, it isn't fair to refer to it as an electronic textbook, textbook, it's nothing of the kind. It's actually a structured course. Uh, you can't go around changing the, the structure and the readings, et cetera, or the references. Okay, so it, is, so it was with Sandel's edX course. Now, so why did we send the letter? Well, there were three main reasons, and I'll try and summarize them. One of them had to do with our own administration, uh, San Jose State Administration, and our president. Um, I was looking over uh, at um, Harry, who knows this very well, since he's a provost at Northridge. He knows, actually, I had a wonderful conversation with him. He knows the people involved. Anyway, so we've been told that there are three great pressures in terms of education in California. One, high school students in California who come into the Cal State system. There's 23 campuses in the Cal State system. It's the largest um, state university in the country, around 430,000 students. Um, they are not adequately prepared. Number two is there's a bottleneck of students waiting to get in, a problem getting for them to get into classes. And three, students take a long time to graduate. Well, to make short twist of this, our president, President Mohammed Kayumi, in a um, white paper that he wrote, um, which was published in 2012, said here's his plan. Um, at least for lower division courses, uh, they are to be taught, 25 to 40 percent of them are to be taught by uh, either MOOCs or SPOCs. I'll just, this is what we're going to do in the future. And he didn't only mean San Jose State. I mean, according to his plan, it was all the 23 campuses, plus all the University of California campuses, plus all of the California community college campuses. Now, uh, that's a lot of students. This is his plan. Um, and that it wasn't he was only thinking about lower division. He was a little bit more vague about upper division, but he did say, we will be redesigning upper division programs. Each institution or group of institutions can build degree programs using a number of possible sources, such as materials already available in open, course, open source courseware, learning modules developed by corporations, national labs, public broadcasting services, libraries. So that's what he had sort of sketched out for upper division courses. So we have this background. It's the president of the university. He says, this is what we're going to do. So this puts us in, this, in this, uh, the position of thinking, OK, now they want us to teach Michael Sandel's course. And this is part of this kind of tsunami that's going to take place. And um, here's a little bit of the wave. OK, um, so we saw it is connected. All right. Um, and I think perhaps that fills in a little bit more why it involved a certain amount of gumption of the junior faculty members to stand up against it. Our president is not a um, person that one uh, could get into a kind of open conversation about these matters. <laughs> okay. So then our other reasons about Michael Sandel's course itself. Um, first, if you watch this course, you see Michael Sandel interacting with his Harvard students, uh, who he periodically refers to as, rightly, um, um, the best. And uh, the idea is they're the creme de la creme. And um, so our students would be watching Michael Sandel talk to them. Um, <laughs> Now, there is an issue at San Jose State. We are very proud of our demography. We are highly diversified. As a matter of fact, uh, so-called, these, these terms are always really murky, but let's just say white, 
are in the minority. Now, um, as far as the people in Michael Sandel's class, yes, there are some people of color, but they're definitely not so many. So we have students of San Jose State who are watching him talk to his students, who he's referring to as particularly uh, superior, and there also is a dem demography issue. They can't speak to him. Um, and then he's talking about Marvelous Sanders Theater, and it is a beautiful place. We don't have anything like that in San Jose State. So the overall impact, we thought, was that this would create an upstairs-downstairs kind of situation for our students. We were inviting them into this scenario. And since the course is on justice, <laughs> <laughs> it seemed particularly like a cruel joke. So um, that was, and then there is the other part uh, in terms of our own way of handling these courses. Uh, there was an undemocratic spirit, uh, we think, we thought, and still think, in terms of uh, one size fits all. There's the idea of taking a course, particularly a course in something like justice, and having it standardized because the, if the course is a big success, it would be, we assume that there would be many second tier, third tier universities to be teaching the same course. And we actually flatter ourselves. We, we think that we have people who teach courses like this who are really quite good. In any case, they're particularly, we are particularly tailored. We are particularly sort of developed to our students' needs. And, it, and it's certainly a good idea, I think this is true in the liberal arts in general, to have a different collection of perspectives. Because then, hopefully within one particular department, but certainly within different colleges and universities. So it seemed um, de democratic for, to us to have such a course that was being um, kind of piped in in this way. All right, now um, I'm not going to finish without, without saying what his reaction was. And I really, I, this is going to come off as if I'm vilifying, I'm sure. But I have to say what has happened and what he did say in the Harvard Crimson, not about us. First, he didn't address us. Now, why should he address us? Well, I think that insofar as this letter has become some sort of media, what do you like, let's say, emblem, I think that's fair. Maybe he should address us, but he never has addressed us. So, okay, fine. But what he did do, and you know, I've really got my ear to the ground about these things now. He was asked in the Harvard Crimson, asked by the editors of the Harvard Crimson, in fact, asked by two reporters in the Harvard, Harvard Crimson, I should say, of the Harvard, in the Harvard Crimson, mm -hmm. what he thought about teaching online courses. And here's what he said. He said, I have never required or even encouraged on-campus students in justice to watch my online lectures before class, before class. To have students watch online lectures in advance would run risk of dampening the spontaneous, unpredictable, and open-ended quality of the discussions that we have in the Sanders Theater. Okay, so now this would be the most benign, in my understanding, form of online course, when you have the actual professor asking them to see this before, before and then discuss it. But he says he wouldn't do that because this would mitigate um, spontaneous, unpredictable, and open-ended quality of discussions. Now that, I, I have to say, it le left me uh, nonplussed. I mean, he has had a brilliant career. I have every reason to respect his integrity and his ethics. But I simply don't understand uh, how he can make such a statement and then sell the course across the country. Um, maybe someday he will explain. Uh, we, can, we await for that. OK. So that's the facts about the letter. Does anybody want to ask any questions? Oops. About the letter. Because I'm going to move on to my reflections, uh, such as they are. Why we were pressured, who pressured us. OK, fine. We can do that maybe in the discussion. All right, now I'm going to get a little bit philosophical and in a traditional way. And I suppose you won't be surprised since that's my background after all. All right, now I want to actually take us out of a technological era, um, way out of the technological era. I do believe that it's fair to say that there's enormous, of course, this is such a truism, enormous we, things that we have to be grateful about in terms of the internet age. 
However, um, I do believe there's a certain tendency to make it into a kind of trophy of our uh, age, and, or perhaps you'd say idol. And um, we can be somewhat blinded by this. So I think it can be useful to consider um, standards of good teaching and education not from our own period. So I'm going to take Plato. <laughs> and I'm going to actually um, quote um, uh, his standards for serious conversation that would better his respondents and use them as criteria for good teaching. In the Gorgias, which is a dialogue, and I, and I particularly like the idea of being a dialogue because after all, these talks are called conversations. And philosophy began as a conversation, if you consider Plato the beginning, Socrates in the West. Come to think of it in the East. I mean, Confucius, after all, his analects are conversation. All right. Um, his criteria are three. The first off is the person needs to honor, respect, knowledge. The second one is the person needs to have good, <coughs> excuse me, good will for the student. You can translate this as benevolence, goodwill, care, if you like. And there needs to be open speech. Now, this word, open speech, is actually, if you, it happens to be a paparacia, has gotten a lot of commentary, but it is not the same thing as free speech. It's more along the lines of, of speech wherein, bold speech wherein one speaks one's mind. An awful lot has been written about this recently by people like Michel Foucault, et cetera, and how the idea of democracy is connected with it. But in any case, I don't want to wander off into that as fascinating the way I think it is. The criteria, again, are threefold. There needs to be knowledge. There needs to be something like goodwill, benevolence, caring for the student. And then there needs to be an openness of discourse. Now, I don't think this is the, these are the most controversial criteria one can come up. So I'm going to actually treat them as reasonable criteria. All right. Now, um, I want to uh, try and dispel a few myths. These have been talked about before, but maybe this is just another angle on them. Um, before I get into trouble spots. Um, first off, one uh, belief that is, is that uh, courses that are particularly taught by MOOCs, and I think it's true of SPOCs, are connected with uh, better paying jobs. And in fact, they serve the market in this way and serve the student. And this is connected, of course, with goodwill, I think, having goodwill for the student, or you're actually going to help them to get a job. And I just want to point to some few things that would seem to indicate that there is some um, mythology involved with that. Um, uh, first off, um, the particular fields that lead to good jobs, um, there's an awful lot of work on this. Um, but uh, in fact, there are various fields within the liberal arts that have a very good record. Now, I'm familiar with my own field, philosophy, so I'm going to make a pitch. As it turns out, philosophy majors, people who have philosophy <coughs> degrees, gets the, have the highest cumulative LSAT scores. Nice the highest community of GRE scores, and they come in second. We come in second in the MBAT. That's a preparation for um, um, Masters of Business Administration. Who comes in first? Mathematicians. Where do business majors come in? <laughs> Pretty low down the list. Um, all right, now, I mean, if you have an English teacher coming here, I'm sure they can give you other stats. I'm a philosophy professor, so I'll give you my stats for us. So, is it the case that that MBA or that particular BA is going to get you a good job? Uh, that's a very uh, you know, superficial way to begin with it because, as it turns out, you might do far better if you've had a lot of background in critical thinking, writing, communication, etc. Okay. Um, now then, I also. Um,
I wanted to make clear that my position is that I don't see that uh, online instruction in its many forms, whether it's MOOCs or SPOCs, or certainly blended, which seems to be far more successful, is that this is somehow a bad idea. But I do think that I want to hold with these th three criteria which are, that I've taken from Plato, which are um, knowledge, goodwill, and benevolence, and open speech. If it's possible to have these courses, online courses, governed by those three criteria, then sure, why not? But then there, the questions are to what is it about those three courses which would seem to go contrary to the criteria? And that's where I'd like to turn and finish up with. Is there something about the nature of online courses or some big part of them that would go contrary to, this, to the, those three conditions of good teaching? And if so, then, there, then we've got clear indication of problems. Well, I'll say number one, the false lure of an elitist education. Um, I'll take edX because I'm particularly familiar with edX, having to do with Michael Sandel's course. If you look at, say, something like their introduction to computer science, which of course they offer who teaches it, um, it turns out not to be, uh, uh, is not Harvard's permanent faculty by any means. There are two um, BA students and there is one one person who is a senior lecturer, but it makes one begin to wonder, is this in fact, is there an element of branding going on in this? There is, I won't say a, an 800 pound gorilla because that is such a cliche, but I do believe there is at least a, oh, let's just say a very, very annoying chipmunk that uh, is very much part of uh, the online scene, which is Phoenix, University of Phoenix. I mean, nobody seems to mention in conversations University of Phoenix. It's been around a long time. Well, I think that one of the things that's going on with edX and their connection to MIT and Harvard and the rest is to make sure that people do not make the association to the University of Phoenix. I mean, the University of Phoenix has this now reputation which is uh, somewhat besmirched, but we're Harvard, we're MIT, we're Stanford, we're UEC Berkeley, so we will not be connected with this. Um, and again, how much are they Harvard? How much are they MIT? How much are they Stanford? Who is actually teaching them? If you look at this, you see that they're not using, in many cases, uh, by any means they're, um, they're their illustrious faculty. And this was pointed out, I think, when you go and talking about the course from Scotland, the Edinburgh course, and who actually taught. It was a course in critical thinking, and it was taught by people who didn't have any particular background in critical thinking. Um, now, um, okay, so one of the things then in terms of the problem with knowledge being conveyed, goodwill, and open discourse is, should we be going in the direction of companies that have this particular imprimatur, are they really gonna be that much better at knowledge than if one were to simply go to the University of Montana and take somebody who's been teaching there for 20 years and gets very good teaching reviews? You know, I think that the, the immediate response is, well, it's from Harvard, you know, of course it's better. Well, you know, that's part of the myth. Okay, the second one is the lack of evaluation. This one would seem to play into um, really all three of the criteria that I mentioned, which you've now heard. Um, let me just say it where I, uh, my university, San Jose State, is again part of the CSU system. It has uh, 473,000 students. Uh, I'm sorry, I wasn't born in 30, I was born in 73. Um, and we are, I think, I think it would be safe to say reviewed in our classes um, maybe even excessively. Every semester our classes are reviewed uh, re recently over the last year and they're reviewed now by computer forms and there's an interesting sort of motivational thing that is if the student doesn't review the particular instructor they take them they get their grades a month later so there's now this real 
uh, carrot or a stick, I'm not sure which one it is, but it's one of those, and uh, in order to make sure they review the instructor. And so they, are, they, they get these, this questionnaire that involves statistical review and also involves handwritten reviews that are all put onto computerized files, and then you can see them all. Now, I am chair of my department. I have to tell you that they make a difference, much more of a difference than I'd like sometimes, because sometimes I feel as if an instructor has been unfairly treated by one particular class but particularly of the temporary faculty or the adjunct faculty, which makes up 50% of, of my department and is pretty much across the board in San Jose State. I won't bore you with statistics of how it varies campus by campus, but let's just say 50%. Different campuses have different amounts. Uh, their jobs are dependent upon those student reviews. If somebody gets bad student reviews, believe me, they get earmarked and they get targeted. I'm going to hear from my dean or somebody, I'm going to hear from them and say, well, why, what's going wrong, wrong here? We, they, you know, so you get the point here, is that when you're dealing with these courses, they are reviewed. Now, how does that compare with online courses? Well, they can be reviewed with Spocks and MOOCs, but it's the private aspect there. There's the private aspect particularly comes in. So I think we got Spocks can be, you know, small, private, or personal, but at least when they're private, then it comes in. Well, they could be reviewed, but are they reviewed? And I just to sort of to up the ante a little bit here, let me, let me quote um, Anand Agarwal, who is the CEO of edX from a few months ago. From what I hear, I'm quoting him now, from what I hear, really good actors can actually teach really well, said Anand Agarwal, CEO of edX, who was until recently a computer science professor at MIT. So just imagine maybe we get Matt Damon to teach Threv Threvenin's theorem, he added, referring to a concept that Argyle covers in a MOOC he teaches on circuits and electronics. I think students would enjoy that more than taking it from Argyle. So he's thinking of hiring Matt Damon. Now, if you look around the literature, you uh, you also find that at Coursera, and this is published by somebody in a blog, Silicon Beat, but they did do some research at Coursera um, that they're trying to get the instructors who don't look good, who don't have you know good looks. Get them side of the screen, you know, just push them off. And they've actually got, <laughs> they particularly have people who are camera friendly, the staff who's camera friendly that they put in there because it's going to make the course sell more. Now, this is obviously appealing to market forces. Now, compare that to the reviewing of a class in terms of the teaching. Um, all right. Um, there is where it seems to me the, as it were, goodwill aspect or the benevolence, that was criterion number two, would seem to go awry. Now, I think it's largely market forces that are at work here. So when we sort these things out, we have to consider what has market forces and what doesn't. Okay, now there's the other one. There's this last one that I'll finish, and these are just some trouble spots. It has to do with something the philosophers love, the a priori, you know, and uh, we love that which is... Uh, claim to be necessarily true. And I'm going to say it's not necessarily true. At least there is a conceptual, conceptual connection between online courses in general and a lack of open speech. Because insofar as the difference between ruled behavior and not ruled behavior. I think that if you have Spocks and MOOCs. Now, I know there can be exceptions, but it, it, this is when, in fact, you have flesh and blood teachers who are being uh, a part of the class. But especially if they're being taught online in a fairly machine-like way, they're going to have to be ruled-like behavior. In a sense, they are different types, and they're kind of extraordinary examples of um, programs, algorithms, routines, rubrics. All these are different kinds of ruled behavior. Now, what do you then do when you have somebody who has unconventional, out-of-the-box sorts of responses? Well, you would expect, and this is where the a priori business comes in, is they would have to in some way be, be wrong. But unfortunately, unconventional, out-of-the-box responses, in many cases, they're simply misguided, mistaken, but that is off also where what is new innovative, and, and particularly creative comes through, from. I mean, if you take, I can't say it's true in all cases, but if you take something that's really going to be changing things, then it's not going to be conventional by definition. So you see, I'm trying to make 
an a priori argument here and saying that if you have algorithm-based, and this could be whether they're correcting papers, if we ever get to the point of being able to correct essays well by algorithms or, or, or quizzes and the rest of it, it's going to tend to exclude this kind of behavior. And the result is that you don't have or it is certainly something that would seem to miss uh, innovative thinking, um, creative thinking, and um, I believe that's part of open speech. I mean, I, I think that the idea of open speech is that somebody can actually be bold and say what they, what they want. Okay, so then I'm just going to sum up. Uh, what did the, our experience with the letter teach us? Well, it, what it has taught us is, frankly, uh, it is very um, sustaining. It has, it has been very restore, resource, uh, has built our faith in free speech. Um, here it is. We took this letter, and, and it, as far as we knew, it was going to go nowhere. I mean, maybe we, it would be somewhere in the San Jose Mercury News, as you know, letters to the editor, and it seems to have bounced all over literally the world. Okay, so this, this makes us feel wonderful, frankly, that um, these newspapers and, and also the public wants to know what of you, which would seem to be going against the trend of very powerful interests. And second off, um, as far as these different three things that I talked about at the end, um, I will stick by those three criteria that Finally, it doesn't mean that there can't be plenty of MOOCs, there can't be plenty of spots, there can't be plenty of other restaurants, but somewhere, somebody <coughs> has to be governing them in a way that maintains conditions of knowledge. There has to be this sense. It not, by knowledge, I mean that the students are made aware of the status of knowledge, the claims of knowledge, not sort of handed out. I had a chance to talk to Andrew, who's one of the co-founders of, um, of Coursera, and he referred to the, uh, the course that he was te teaching as simply content content. All right, as if it was, an, and some of his employees who I also got to talk to referred to it as product. Now, um, and you know, they referred to the students as end users. Now, uh, in that situation, uh, how can we have, um, it, it seems to me that knowledge, the sense of being able to understand conditions of knowledge, you know, what claim does this have to truth, which is part of what you want to teach people, uh, can easily fall by the wayside. You've heard the arguments about goodwill. Many people brought this up in different, uh, in fact, over in, this, in the sessions that uh, are around uh, midday today. Without that, now it could be there, but obviously uh, that's something that if, if market forces really constrain, uh, can be given up. And then the last one of open speech, that seems to be most endangered. Um, because in order to bring that about, you really do need to have something like uh, a dialogue. Um, and I think a person who is very good at it and uh, you know, really respectful of it. Even, the, even flesh and blood Teachers can have plenty of time, instructors, professors, whatever, can have plenty of time, difficulty with that. Okay, I'll finish there. Um, so, that's it. Thank you.